My name is Jim Hollister, park ranger at Minuteman National Historical Park, and we are here today at the Whittemore House. So the Whittemore House is actually the only witness structure um, that's part of Minuteman National Historical Park that is within the town of Lexington, and it has a very interesting story. So on April 19th of 1775, Jacob Whittemore and his son-in-law Moses Reed, who lived here in this house, um, they were military age and they should have mustered on the town common in response to the alarm that morning carried by Paul Revere, who actually came right past this house uh, on his famous midnight ride. However, they weren't there. And the reason they weren't there is because Moses' wife, Sarah, had given birth two weeks before. And so Moses and Jacob were confronted with a, a very interesting dilemma. Do they fulfill their obligation to their community? to stand on the town common with their neighbors, with the militia company, uh, to face the threat of the British army? Or is there a higher duty to their family? And what they chose to do was to safeguard Sarah because she was dangerously ill. So a lot of the accounts that we have from April 19th, 1775, we have a lot of military accounts from soldiers, combatants, but we also have a lot of civilian stories, people who are literally caught up in the storm. And to talk more about that, I am joined today by historian Alex Kane, author of the book, We Stood Our Ground, Lexington in the First Year of the Revolution, and he also maintains the blog, Historical Nerdery. So Alex, I remember a few years ago, you came up to me, I think it was in March, and mm -hmm. said, hey Jim, I get a great idea for Battle Road. And I'm like, now, really? <laughs> and you uh, pitched the idea of doing a civilian evacuation scenario. Yes. Which, I'm glad I listened. Um, so now when we get back to doing Battle Road, what you see before the battle, you actually see um, about 40 or 50 women, children, older men processing along the Battle Road with their belongings, wheelbarrows, packs, baskets, everything, uh, portraying um, the people who had to leave their home in a hurry. And so this was based on your research, and yes. I was hoping that you could share with us some stories that you found about civilian evacuations. Of course. Uh, it, it's a wonderful event that, that the park does, the civilian evacuation of, of April 19th, 1775. And my attention was drawn to it, uh, as you indicated, around March, I think it was 2016, mm -hmm. where I, I said, I was talking with other reenactors and other historians. I was like, what stories are we missing? We, you know, we, we focus on the military aspect, we focus on the combat. What are we missing? And we realized, oh my God, the civilian experience. And so we discovered as we looked at various accounts that there is a limited number of accounts from the 18th century. Most of the accounts are from the early 19th century um, where they describe uh, the, this massive evacuation that took place between Mononymy and Concord. And Mononymy, for our modern viewers, is the town of Arlington. Yes. And so it, it wasn't dozens, it was hundreds of families. And you see this where families, for example, it started in Lexington. And around midnight when Revere and Dawes arrived in town and the alarm bells started to ring, many of the residents on the Bay Road, which is now Massachusetts Ave and, and Route 2A, realized, oh my God, this military hostile force is coming towards us. Right. And so there begins this massive evacuation. And as you had described, uh, not only just the Reed family, uh, but you had the Clark family, you had the Parker family, you had the Mulligan family, you had dozens and dozens of Lexington families where they literally would gather their personal belongings, hide them because they were afraid that the British were going to loot them. And on top of that, many of the items they were hiding had a legal value uh, mm -hmm. to the female population of, of Middlesex County. Mm -hmm. um, under old colonial laws, uh, a man, uh, when a woman married a man, she essentially, all of her property became the males, right. with the exception of domestic tools and tools of production, mm -hmm. uh, such as silverware, fabric, uh, cups, uh, jewelry, and furniture. So many women were actually going out and hiding uh, communion silver, personal belongings, putting them in empty tree trunks, uh, putting them in, um, uh, in brush heaps, and then they would just flee to get as far away as possible. This uh, panic, as, as I, I found it, it began to spread uh, as the time the various uh, men and militia companies started mm -hmm. to mobilize. So you had uh, Mary Farrar in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And Mary Farrar in Lincoln has an account where she realizes as she watches the Lincoln Minute companies march off to war, mm -hmm. the British are going to be going by her residence as well, and that she's in jeopardy. 
And she and her family gathered everything that they could, and they fled to an area that was called Oki Bottom. And this was a nickname of a retired forest area, a, a, a wood stand or a yep. wood lot. And many residents of Lincoln hid in that area. Well, Mary Farrar realizes that they were starting to flee. Oh my God, I, I left the cattle, you know, still in the barn. And if the British have about value, yeah, but it's value to the family. It's their livelihood. Yes, and, and, and livestock was considered highly valuable at the time. And she's thinking in her mind, the British are not only going to loot the property, then it is going to burn it. Right. So she goes back and she, she basically releases the livestock. Okay. It, it just sets them loose, doesn't bring them back to Oki Bottom. Now, you move forward to, um, uh, to Concord, uh, where you find Mary Moulton. Now, Mary Moulton is interesting because she actually submitted, uh, in the months after the battles of Lexington and Concord, a petition to the Massachusetts Provincial Congress mm -hmm. of her accounts and of, you know, requests for compensation. And she talks about how basically as the British uh, expedition force is starting to enter Concord, the panic reaches Concord. Right. And in the center of town, people began just a mass exiting of the, uh, of the area. And she describes how she and her neighbors grabbed all their personal belongings and basically then just continued to, uh, to flee. And this is what you see throughout the entire uh, area. Now, the one that highlights you know, just how widespread this panic was, yeah. Uh, was a woman by the name of uh, Hannah Winthrop. Mm -hmm. Now, Hannah Winthrop was from Cambridge. Now, Cambridge is on the other side of Monotomy, now Arlington. Yep. And she describes how when word of the British expedition reached her, as well as the subsequent battles of Lexington and Concord, she and her husband, who was gravely ill, so as a result, he too did not fight uh, mm -hmm. on April 19th, began to flee. They ended up in an area called Fresh Pond, uh, which is basically uh, out towards, I, I suspect, um, uh, west of Cambridge. Yep. And they ended up in a household, and there was upwards of 80 women in the household. And she described how women were wailing and crying uh, because they did not know what was happening with their husbands. Children um, were uh, basically uh, just constantly crying, and she said it was the most melancholy sight that she had been in. Uh, and she decided, I just can't stay here. Mm -hmm. So she and her husband partnered up with another uh, uh, family, got a hold of a chase, and was able to take that and A chase is a, uh, a two-wheeled horse-drawn cart. Yes. Yeah. And they made their way to Andover, where they spent the next two days. Uh, but the, at the height of the battle, so now we're talking around noon, one or two o'clock, um, the Reverend William Gordon, who, who arrived two days or a day or two after the battles of Lexington and Concord, went out and interviewed people about what happened. And he came across many accounts by at the height of the battle of between about one and two in the afternoon. The roads are clogged, not only with militia trying to get into the battle, but the civilian populace trying to get away from the battle. And they described how women and children were clogging the road, just weeping and wailing because they didn't know where to go. I mean, it's gonna be you know, an incredible amount of confusion yes. and fear, and really, the events of April 19th are not only, it's not just a battle, it's a humanitarian crisis in yeah. many ways. Yes. Um, but it also strikes me that what these women are doing is the men are fighting and protecting, but they are also protecting. They're protecting um, the property, the children, the livestock. Yes, there, there was definitely, you, you could see that, that it, it wasn't just simply the, the women, children, or elderly men, or enslaved people, just yes. simply, we're out of here, we're going to run as quickly as possible. Each of them saw that they had an important familial role to take in order to protect the family homestead. And there were women, as you described, who either had just delivered or were on the verge of delivery. Families got together to move them to safety. There were women with toddlers who risked everything just simply to get them out of the way. One of the most compelling counts is Anna Monroe. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna Monroe is the wife of uh, Sergeant William Monroe of uh, Captain John Parker's company right. in Lexington. She evacuated the Monroe Tavern in Lexington twice. Yeah. Uh, prior to the Battle of Lexington, then she returned to try and keep watch over the tavern while her husband was away. Well, Percy's relief call arrived. Right. And her daughter, who was about between three and five at the time of the Battle of Lexington, uh, is only one of two child witness accounts that I'm aware of. And in her recollection later in her life, she describes how basically her mother at the last minute 
um, evacuated the house again, its Percy's relief column uh, is setting up its defensive perimeter. Yeah, the enemy is literally at the gates. It's literally at the gates, and she, the child is describing how she said, I remember seeing the red coats, and I remember hearing the firing of cannons over my head. That's all I could remember. But her, she went on to describe how her mother was carrying an infant child in one hand, had the three-year-old, you know, by the hand, mm -hmm. and then had another son uh, tagging along behind them all while this battle was going on. And you, um, she just described, she said, her, my mother would later say, you know, I was so afraid that the Redcoats were going to come and take you uh, it, just because of this. The other close combat to deal with enslaved people. Mm -hmm. With enslaved people, many of them, uh, for the males, uh, if they weren't serving in the militia, they were actually guarding the property. Interesting. And, and there is an account of a tavern uh, in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And on the retreat through Cambridge, which was just as bloody as the door-to-door -door fight in Monotony, sure. um, the British uh, troops broke into this tavern, drained the molasses uh, kegs, drained the alcohol, uh, started smashing property, and then set the house on fire. After they evacuated, the family uh, slave who had remained behind, mm -hmm. according to the 19th, early 19th century account, he crossed the firefight, got into the tavern, and then extinguished the fire, risking his life to do this. My goodness. Um, so this is a lot, as I said, people weren't just simply panicking, but at the same time they realized uh, they had a role to serve as well, and they were risking their lives to at least maintain some semblance of society. Yeah, and it, and it wasn't just a panic. I mean, it sounds like there was real property destroyed uh, yes. during the retreat. The, the, the height of the destruction started in Lexington. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an account uh, of the Andover Minutemen when they were coming through Lexington. Now, they missed the battle for a variety of reasons we're not going to get into. Um, but they, it's an Essex County thing. Yeah, it is an Essex County thing, and as an Essex County resident, I'm sorry. Um, but they ended up, um, when they reached Lexington, probably about 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they noticed that the, the first thing they noticed is the town meeting house, which in 18th century New England is also their church, right. has several cannonball holes through it. They're seeing dead soldiers on the road. They're seeing dead cattle, dead hogs on the road. But then they start looking at the houses and they're seeing multiple houses burning. And they're seeing every house from East Lexington onward just looted. What happened was, is when Percy's relief column uh, saved Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Smith's expedition force, mm -hmm. They then had to march back to Boston. Well, they realized they had to go through East Lexington, Monotony, and Cambridge. And to do so, it was going to be a house-to-house -house and door-to-door -door fight. Right. So as a result, the vanguard of the British column is literally firing the houses, trying to burn as many as they can, uh, while they're trying to flush out militiamen. And uh, somewhere in the column, uh, there's British soldiers going in and ransacking the houses. And, and General Gage mentions that in his follow-up, in his order, saying that you know there was you know, an excess of looting yes. and, and, and poor discipline. Yes, there was. And it's interesting because historian Joel Bowie has come across a smattering of evidence. It's one or two accounts. But there are actually accounts of Massachusetts militiamen who may have been looting as well on their way. Now, if you take a look at Lexington, Lexington had at least three homes fired, uh, multiple houses looted. Uh, when I was looking last night at the accounts, the total property damage for Lexington was 4,500 pounds which translated today is over a million dollars. So if you, you think just in that sense, in, incorporating inflation, it's just massive destruction. Monotomy is the same. Monotomy houses uh, were described as riddled with bullets, all the windows blown out or smashed. Uh, one house, uh, the woman described when I returned after evacuating, my front living room was ankle deep in blood just because of the fighting hand to hand and all the destruction was taking place. That was at the Jason Russell house. Yes, the Jason, that would be the Jason Russell house. And you know, the Reverend William Gordon, who I referenced earlier, described um, how he was so offended at the looting. Now, why would he have been offended? In the 18th century, looting or housebreaking was considered a capital crime. Mm -hmm. It was on par with murder. Yes. So as a result, this was very, very offensive to, to the uh, Massachusetts populace. Life, liberty, property. Bingo. That's exactly it. And so he, he mentioned how you would have been shocked at the behavior of the regulars, so-called, because he just felt they were completely that out of control. Unbelievable. Well, thank you for sharing thank all you. of that, that research. This is really just the tip of the iceberg. I've yes. read your blog, Historical Nerdery. 
uh, there's such a wealth of information there uh, that we use quite frequently. Um, and uh, thank you for, for sharing this with us. Thank and, you so much. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you.